Welcome to our series, Hope in the Hard Times, and it's a study of First and Second Peter. And here we are in Second Peter chapter 2, and we're about to experience that. But before we do, let's just jump back one step back to Second Peter chapter 1 and just look at a, a message that came forth in that chapter. And he says this in verse 3, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life, Add to your faith goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, mutual affection, and most of all, love. And it says in verse 8, If you possess these qualities in increasing measure, you will keep from being ineffective and unproductive. So the opposite is obviously true. If we possess these, inqual- these qualities of, of love, self-control, knowledge, goodness, all these things in increasing measure, we will be effective and productive. Now let's go on to chapter 2. It is 2 Peter chapter 2, and I call this beware and be wary. Beware and be wary. It basically means the same thing, those two words. But it says this, we need to really be wise because you'll see that there's false teachers out there, there's misleading messages, and they're coming at us greater than ever before in more ways than they ever did before, probably more frequency than they ever did before because in the modern age that we live in we're inundated with destructive heresies from more sources in more ways that were even imaginable when Peter was alive and writing these letters to the churches think about the the immense amount of messaging that comes to us every day through screens and otherwise and many, many of those things are false not much of it is the truth of the gospel And so we have to be vigilant, and Peter exhorts us to be vigilant in regard to guarding ourselves from deception and protecting ourselves and our flocks from what he calls false teachers and false prophets. All right, so let's get into 2 Peter chapter 2, starting with verse 1. But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who brought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their depraved conduct and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with fabricated stories. All right, so he's warning that false teachers among you, he says, among the people, this is not talking about other faiths or other religions. That's, that's understood. But even among the flocks, there's those who identify as Christ followers, yet they preach a message that denies God's sovereignty. Very important, because if you deny God's sovereignty, as Peter says here, in other words, you're showing disregard for God as the ultimate authority, disregarding his word as moral law for Christian living, and they claim identity with the gospel, so they have some affinity with the, some of the teachings of Jesus or with the gospel, but they teach messages that are contrary to biblical values and scriptural truths. Now, this is so important because some people, they like Jesus. They want to identify with Jesus just like they might want to identify with Mahatma Gandhi or other people through history who you know, seemingly were good guys, but they teach messages that don't adhere to scriptural truth and and biblical values and it says here that god's not slow in bringing punishment and correction to these false teachers whose very goal is to deceive the church let's continue in second peter 2 verse 3 their condemnation has long been hanging over them and their destruction has not been sleeping for if god did not spare angels when they sinned but sent them to hell putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment If he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what's going on, going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued Lot, a righteous man who was distressed by the depraved conduct of lawlessness, for that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. If this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to hold the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. This is especially true for those who follow the corrupt desire of the flesh and despise authority. Wow, what a warning. He uses 
Old Testament examples of Noah, of Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, he talks about them bearing, God bringing forth judgment upon the unrighteous and protecting those who were righteous, like the ones we just mentioned. See, God knows how to rescue the godly and punish the unrighteous, especially the unrighteous who follows what he calls here the corrupt desire of the flesh. That's what he said in, in verse 10. And, and, and this word, the flesh, is the Greek word sarx, S-A-R-K or S-A-R-X, and that means sinful nature. It's not so much skin and bones and skin and bodily tissue. It's talking about the sinful nature, the flesh. Uh, it's always in conflict with the spirit. It's stri the flesh is striving to crave, you satiate those cravings of the sinful body and the mind, and it always leads to destruction. One of my favorite verses, Romans 8, 6, tells us that. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. Let's continue to verse 10. Bold and arrogant, they are not afraid to heap abuse on celestial beings. Yet even angels, although they are stronger and more powerful, do not heap abuse on such beings when bringing judgment on them from the Lord. But these people blaspheme in matters they do not understand. They are like unreasoning animals, creatures of instinct, born only to be caught and destroyed, and like animals, they too will perish. Verse 13, they will be paid back with harm for the harm they have done. Whoa, that's a warning. Now he uses the word blaspheme here. And blaspheming really means to speak irreverently about God or sacred things. That's the definition, but they speak irreverently about God in matters they don't understand. And they just, un, like unreasoning animals, he says, they're just creatures of instinct, their own way, their orientation, whatever they feel that their human nature craves or desires or leads them to or compels them to, that becomes the rule of law, not the word of God. Now, God is a forgiving God. He is a forgiving God. His mercies are everlasting. He forgives those, all those who cry out to him. But, hear this, God is also a God of justice and often allows the consequences of sin to take place. You see, God is not mocked. We read about this in Galatians 6, 7 through 8. What does it mean that God is not mocked? Well, here's what it says. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, he will reap in return. The one who sows to please the flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. But the one who sows to please the spirit, from the spirit will reap eternal life. You reap what you sow. Whether you're a believer or not, whether you are a godly person who believes in God or the most devout atheist who doesn't even acknowledge God's existence, you reap what you sow. Now, often the destruction comes swiftly but other times it comes over time. And no one who pursues wickedness gets away with it, especially when it is directed towards God's people, particularly his children. And Jesus talked about this. And he, and he says this in Luke 17, 1, things that, things that cause people to stumble are bound to come, but woe to anyone through whom they come. It would be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. You see, Jesus recognized, in this case it was the Pharisees, leading people who were seeking God into a way of deception and corruption. And he said it would, it's better for them to have a millstone thrown around their neck and thrown into the sea so they could stop doing that, perhaps. Peter called Jesus the shepherd of our souls in, in 1 Peter. The shepherd of our souls. And the primary job of the shepherd is to protect the sheep. Yeah, keep them together, guard them, guide them, feed them, lead them, but to protect the sheep. And in this case, the shepherd is protecting them from the, from the threat in, that comes within. And that's kind of what's different here in 2 Peter 2, is he's talking about the threat from within. He's not really talking about the Romans, he's not, because they are a threat. He's not even talking about the Pharisees and Sadducees and those Jews that are out to get them and have oftentimes arrested and beaten them. He's talking about the threat from within. And Matthew talks about this as well. Jesus says, Matthew 7, 15, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. Now, throughout the gospels, we as followers of Jesus are called sheep. 
John 10, my sheep hear my voice. He calls us sheep. But within these sheep, there's those that have sheep's clothing, maybe a woolly coat. <laughs> maybe they look like a sheep, but inside they're, they're the a ferocious, or in this case, a, 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 a ferocious wolf. Their desire is to devour the sheep. That's an analogy that we have to keep in mind. Let's continue with 2 Peter 2, verse 13. <laughs> their idea of pleasure is to carouse in broad daylight, they are blots and blemishes, reveling in their pleasures while they feast with you. With eyes full of adultery, they never stop sinning. They seduce the unstable. They are experts in greed and a cursed brood. They have left the straight way and wandered off to follow the way of Balaam, son of Bezer, who loved the wages of wickedness. But he was rebuked for his wrongdoing by a donkey, an animal without speech, who spoke with a human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. Okay, so Peter is assuming that you know about Balaam. Um, Peter, as you know, was raised Jewish, raised in the synagogue, uh, understood all the Old Testament stories, including this one from Numbers chapter 22. And it's a really interesting, somewhat comical story in some ways. I mean, here you have Balaam, who was a known prophet. He could understand things from the Lord. He had a gift of prophecy, even foretelling the uh, future. But he had taken money from... Balak, who was the king of the Midianites, I believe, at this time. But he had taken money to curse the Israelites, to lay a curse on them so they wouldn't succeed in battle. Now, this angered the Lord. So he, the Lord, as he was going out to curse the Israelites, pray, placed an, a powerful angel, invisible angel, at least invisible to, to Balaam, in this narrow path, this angel guarding the way. And as they're approaching it, the donkey saw the angel. Balaam did not. And the donkey would not go past it. And Balaam is beating his donkey, trying to get him to go through this pass because he didn't see the angel. Beating him three times, beat the donkey. The donkey would not proceed any further. He saw this powerful angel. <coughs> well, just when Balaam was about to kill the donkey, the donkey spoke up, literally, in a human voice. Spoke up and rebuked Balaam for what he was about to do. And at that point, God opened the eyes of Balaam to see this angel. Oh, he fell down before the, the angel. Now, he was in reverence to the Lord here, but what we see, why Peter uses this, is someone who started out on, the, on a really good path, a faithful prophet, was lured away, in this case by the love of money, to actually speak out, act out against God's people. And uh, that did not go unpunished. Balaam died, was killed in the battle that he was trying to warn against. All right, so 2 Peter, continue, verse 17, chapter 2. These people are springs without water and mists driven by a storm. Blackest darkness is reserved for them, for they mouth empty, boastful words, and by appealing to the lustful desires of the flesh, they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom while they themselves are slaves to depravity. For people are slaves to whatever has mastered them. Well, that's a great quote. So once again, he's talking about these false teachers who prey upon those whom the Lord had, has rescued, set free from their former lives, and promises them more freedom by appealing to their lustful desires of the flesh. This is rampant in modern Christianity. Instead of some of these teachers, false prophets even, instead of appealing to the continuation of their repentance, churning from their, their former life, yielding to God, experiencing the goodness of God that, are, that come from obedience. Uh, it's called in Matthew 3, fruits of repentance. Instead of continuing them on that journey of sanctification, they said, you know what? Why don't you explore the pleasures that are available to you, the lustful pleasures that you might have been keeping yourself from, but that you really can enjoy and imbibe in. Imagine that. And even mainline churches, even evangelical denominations, we see this, this narrative. God sets people free you know, from being slaves to lust and whatever their addictions are, whatever it is, and gives them freedom that comes from walking in the path of righteousness, the path that God intends for them. And then these false teachers come in and entice these people into believing lies about what the Bible says about the issues at hand, the issues of the day. Lies about marriage, lies about sexuality, lies about gender. They 
they entice them to doubt the Bible, to disagree with the Bible on matters like the virgin birth, about Israel, God's purposes for Israel. What about the literal resurrection of Jesus? Did it really happen? They're taught to question those things. That one in and itself, our, our whole faith is contingent upon that, according to 1 Corinthians 15, Peter, Paul tells us that. In other words, they place themselves above the authority of the word of God and they operate in the flesh. And they promise freedom, be a free Christian, while they themselves are slaves to depravity. Remember that quote we just read, people are slaves to whatever has mastered them. Ask any addict if that's true. People are slaves to whatever has mastered them. Often the most vociferous, that means they talk a lot, they use their voice a lot, vociferous teachers of false doctrine and unbiblical principles are propagated by those who themselves are entrenched in the very same sin that they condone. They want to walk on a lifestyle of sin. It's not just enough for them to do it in an unrepentant way, but they want to entice others to come into that so they you know, can have some camaraderie. Um, or they want to align themselves with people. I will make an allowance. I will change my view about the word of God so that I can bring in someone or align myself with someone who disagrees with the word of God. And Peter makes a very stark statement about these people as he ends this chapter. 2 Peter 2, 20 through 22. If they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it, and are overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. Of them the proverbs are true. A dog returns to its own vomit and a sow that is washed returns to her wallowing in the mud. This is from Proverbs 26. Have you ever tried witnessing to one of these wayward Christians, someone who, who clearly left, walked away from the path of righteousness, yet they're still in name alone, maybe a Christian. Have you ever tried to reason with them or, or to talk to them? It's exponentially harder to preach to that person, in my opinion, in my experience, than it is to an unbeliever and maybe even to an atheist. Because these are those who have a knowledge of salvation, a, 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 a working head knowledge of the word of God, and maybe uh, somewhat of a relationship with Jesus. But their will, their determined will, they will not submit. They will not submit to the things of God. They will not submit to the word of God. They've turned their back on their faith and their hearts become hardened to the things of God, usually more than they were before they knew about God, before they were saved. See, sometimes they even know the word and then they deny the word. They contradict the word willingly and influence others as well. I don't know if you've met people like this, apostate people. I don't know if you have, but Peter has, and he's talking about these people who use their knowledge and their seeming authority of their knowledge of the word of God to influence people off the path of righteousness onto a lost path. And sadly, there's even prominent people in the world today who use a platform that was given to them by their faith in God. Maybe they were a former well-known Christian leader, a Christian past, pastor or, or author, maybe a Christian musician, and now determined that they don't believe in God anymore. And there's some out there. There are former Christians and current atheists and they use this platform to influence other Christians to question their own faith and ultimately to turn away from God. This is who Peter is talking about. It's better, as Peter says, it, it would have been better in verse 21 for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. It's a value statement that Peter makes I tend to agree with. Now the question usually comes up from this. Okay, can someone lose their salvation by turning away? Because it seems to be that is what Peter is saying here. This is not really what Peter is saying, but this is a good question. And it's a question only God can answer. Only God can answer. God has mercy on who he has mercy on, compassion on who he has compassion on. That's repeated in scripture. Now, if 
Let's look at it. If salvation is a gift, a free gift that is given by grace through faith, not by works, that means we can't earn it and that means we can't really keep it by conduct and behavior. It's not your conduct and behavior that keeps you saved. But if we're truly saved, we're given the spirit of adoption. God signs the adoption papers, stamps them, and we're made into a new creation. So that adoption and that creation is permanent. So what changes? You know, when we become a believer, some people say we are a convert. And that's not such a bad term. You're a convert. But there's a difference between a convert and a convertible. <laughs> you know what a convertible is. A convertible is something like, you know, convertible couch, a convertible car. You can have it open. You could have it closed. Open, closed, open, closed. Not a convert. A convert, once it's converted or we are converted, we are changed into a new creation. Now, what about these people Peter's speaking of or people we know? It's very possible that those who have, quote unquote, known the way of righteousness, then turned their backs on it, were never truly saved to begin with. And were always merely sheep in wolves' clothing. I'm sorry, wolves in sheep's clothing. But again, remember, only God knows the heart and only God can judge. Jesus says, however, and listen to what he does when he addresses this. In Matthew 7, verse 15, Jesus says, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire, verse 20, thus by their fruit you will recognize them. So another question, what about people who are really gifted leaders, really gifted teachers or musicians or singers or songwriters or speakers or luminaries, these Christian people, what is it about them that validates their ministry? Is it the fact that they have just an incredible gift of speaking, singing, or writing, or whatever? Is it because they have a huge following? Is it because they seem to operate in Holy Spirit power? Is that what validates them as a good tree? Not really, according to what we just read in Matthew 7. We do not judge a tree by its gifts, but by its fruit. Here in New Jersey, we have great local orchards, especially in the early fall. You can go to the local orchards around New Jersey and see the most abundant, beautiful crop of um, many varieties of apples. Apples, it's one of the greatest fruits that come from New Jersey's Garden State. So it's apple picking here. And some apples have wonderful trees and others not so much. And, and the good trees bear good fruit and the bad trees don't necessarily bear good fruit. Good, good fruit. But there's a difference between an apple tree, which is a fruit tree, and a gift tree. And I'll explain that. So a gift tree versus a fruit tree. What's the difference? Well, if you think about an apple tree, that's a fruit tree. Think about a, a beautiful, abundant, fully blossomed, fully fruitful apple tree ready to harvest. That's a fruit tree. And it bears fruit because it is a genuine tree and it's alive. Remember what Matthew 7 says, 17 and 20. Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but by their fruits you will know them. Now, there's another tree that shows up around this time of year, usually in the big box stores that are preparing for their Christmas season, and they bring out their Christmas trees. And I'm talking about the beautiful artificial trees that come pre-flocked, come pre-lit. You snap them together, you put them in your house. And this is a Christmas tree. Now, especially these, these Christmas trees, they will not bear fruit. But usually they can and usually do bear gifts. I'll just look at one of these trees on Christmas morning. So just imagine the most beautiful, artificial, clearly artificial, well-lit, well-decorated tree. And what is the difference between these trees? One is a genuine tree that bears genuine fruit. Another is an artificial tree that may or may not bear incredible gifts. And some of the gifts under those tree might be better than an apple in some people's in some people's mind. But which one is genuine? There's only one way to tell a genuine tree, and it is by its fruit. That's why Matthew 7, 22, Jesus continues. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? 
cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. You see, I consider myself a charismatic Christian. That means charis is gift, matic is motion, gifts in motion. I love to see people walk in their gifts and put them in motion. I love the gifts of the Spirit, but they are not the indicator of God's presence, God's genuine presence in someone's life, according to Matthew 7. The fruit of the Spirit that we see in Galatians 5 and the fruit of repentance that we see in Matthew 3, these are what determine a genuine tree, a genuine good tree. And only a good tree can bear good fruit. So we have to ask ourselves in closing, closing, what about us? Do our gifts bear fruit for the kingdom of God to serve others or just to serve ourselves? How about this? Do we bear the fruit of the Spirit, the love, peace, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, meekness, self-control in our private life along with our public life? How about this? Our relationship with God. Is, it, is, it, is the fruit of our relationship with God, our prayer, our devotion to Him, is it genuine? Is it authentic? You see, only the Holy Spirit can empower us with the wisdom and the knowledge and the fruit of the Spirit that comes from God. It doesn't come from any other source but the power of the Holy Spirit within us. And we can't get those things. We can't get genuine fruit by trying harder or being smarter or influencing more people or earning favor. It's Here's how it comes. By submitting to God and allowing His Spirit to govern our lives and produce genuine, authentic, powerful, life-giving fruit of the Holy Spirit. If we are rooted in the Holy Spirit, we will bear fruit. He wants us to be good trees. He wants us to bear good fruit. Good fruit to honor him. Good fruit to bless the church. Good fruit to bring the lost, many who are lost, into the care of the good shepherd who loves them and died for them and wants them to come into a full-on adopted relationship with him. And that's Jesus. Jesus said, go forth, preach the gospel, and bear good fruit. I believe that you are a good tree if you're rooted in the Holy Spirit. But allow the Holy Spirit to move through you and work through you and bear gifts, the gifts that are the fruit of the Holy Spirit. May God bless you.